to move over soon. I don't think this is working. And so the pledge tells us what we are, what does it mean to be a Singaporean? And this is the pledge, right? This is the pledge. It says, we, the citizens of Singapore, pledge ourselves as one united nation. We are united people, so we're people. <laughs> Regardless of race, language, or religion, to build a democratic society based on justice and equality so as to achieve happiness, prosperity, and progress. So a lot of things, a lot of thought that went into preparing this pledge. They, they thought about what do we want Singapore to be? What do we want Singapore to become? And it says we promise as citizens of this country, this is what we're committed to. That we don't care about race, we don't care about language, and we're going to be a democratic society, we're still working on that. And it's based on justice and equality. And then what we want to achieve, the, the end goal is important. Where you want to go is important. No point being committed to something, but you're working towards nothing. And so the end goal is what? A happy and prosperous society. And that's what being a Singaporean citizen means, and we, we aim and we commit to that. That's what we say. The Bible has its own pledge to his kingdom. In the book of Luke, you consistently see that Luke compares and he records the facts of the gospel, of the life of Jesus. He's talking about, hang on guys, there is this earthly kingdom and there is another kingdom which you are called to become a part of. And as he continued, as he continued, he wrote the book of Acts. And people say, cannot be proven, but people say that the book of Acts was Luke, Luke's summary of Christian dumb out to the point of Paul before he appeared before the, the, the judges of Rome to defend himself. It was the, the legal document prepared for, for Paul to take to court in front of the pagan Roman ruler to prove and show himself that the Christians are not against the Roman government but they are of another kingdom but this kingdom does not threaten the Roman government but adds to its beauty and glory and he's there to prove that he as a, a, a apostle of this kingdom is not trying to go against the government but he's trying to support them but make them better and then, and then also to help human beings become a better people because they become Euro citizens, the citizens of the Roman Empire and citizens so that's what Acts was about it's a summary of who Christians are what they do, what they strive for, and at the end of the day, what they commit to. And so the first chapter of Acts tells us this pledge. It's an instruction from Jesus to his disciples, just as he, just before he flew off, just, as, just before he flew off. It's found in Acts, the first chapter, verse 8. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. And Acts, verse, chapter 1, verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yes, yeah. You know this week I was um, watching our general conference session. If you do not know what that is, that's where a representative from the Adventist Church from all around the world gather in San Antonio, Texas to decide on, on different things about the church. We're not going to talk about the contents of both or anything about that, but if you just observe uh, the, the makeup of the people there, I have, I have on the ground reporters, because a lot of my friends, a lot of my classmates are in San Antonio, and they've been taking pictures of different aspects of the meeting. And then there's this, there's this part where there's moves from different mission groups around the world, different organizations, power organizations, and the Adventist Church. And you see that represented, like the whole Adventist church is represented. And you see people from all over the world. Apparently, according to my friend, the report has come out, the stats has come out, there's over 180 countries represented in San Antonio right now. That's the Adventist church. It's right there. 180 different countries. A lot of people, a report came out from Dr. Umbu, who we know, who joined us for worship sometime. They say nowadays, now, the Sunday Adventist church is at 18.1 million membership. After his audit. I think we were supposed to be like 20, but then he said, no, 2 million of them don't exist. So it's 18.1 million. He went and the audience reported that the church is 18.1 million. How big is Singapore? About 5, 6 million. 
So the World Church is three times the citizens or the inhabitants of this tiny island of Singapore. That's the church that we are a part of. Because this instruction, because it says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. This is the pledge if you want to become a citizen of the Christian kingdom. This is the pledge. Before you pledge, there's something that says you will receive power from who? Holy Spirit. My friend like to call him the most neglected God. Seriously. We pray to God the Father in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit stands by the side. And then the Bible tells us he's actually the one that translates our language, you know, to, to God. He helps God hear the truest, deepest prayer that we have. We may pray in words, but what we mean with the words may not be what we really want. You know, you have, you have that experience where you want to say something, but you don't say it, but you just frustrated and you wish somebody could explain it, and the friend comes in and says, What he's trying to say is this, 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 and like, yes, what he said. So the Holy Spirit does that with God. And sometimes we're at this point in our lives, this situation in our lives, where we kind of talk, just Ugh! That's when I get cut off by the taxi three times in a row. Just go, Ugh! I love you. <laughs> you just you pray God patience. That's one of my prayers is God patience. You can't even say it. I'm so angry sometimes. And it's always been translate that to God the Father, God the Father explains it. He says, I know, I know my child. He's okay. You cut your off sometimes. You receive power from this guy. But then you ask me, James, but the Holy Spirit, isn't He always there? Isn't He working in our hearts all along? Doesn't the fact that I move from a non-believer to believe in Christ, believe in God, to accept Jesus, isn't that the work of the Holy Spirit? Yes. <coughs> All humanity experience the power of the Holy Spirit. But why does the verse says you must wait and then you will receive future tense. It says you will receive, not that you have received. It says you will receive. Then what does it mean? Does it mean that the Holy Spirit is not working in our lives right now? No. It is working in your life. But it says it's like something like this. Do you know what this is? Clarence says he passed his physics exam. What is that? Alright? So he's good, he passes his business. Right? So these are atoms, and, and you know the power of atom has been there since forever. Since forever. But until recent century, we have not been able to harness its power for good and unfortunately for bad. The atomic bomb was the first time this world witnessed something that's been with us, in us, around us, all along, but see its power was displayed. And the whole island was destroyed on the same date as my birthday. 6th of August. The atomic bomb, the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. So an exam, a straight exam. Which day? My birthday. Bomb says, man, your birth is like Hiroshima. <laughs> the impact is still felt by the noise you make. <laughs> but the fact is, on the 6th of August, 1943, the world witnessed the power of the atomic bomb. If you watch videos of what happened, it's horrible. Things like the music stand, the piano, the chairs just melt away in contact with this invisible force. It's been there all along. We use it every day, but not to the extent of the atomic explosion. Thank God we've moved away from using it as a weapon. We tried. I think we tried to move away from it. And now we harness that energy and we improve. And now we have nuclear energy that is driving half the world. Although I'm not for it. Because it's so dangerous. 
but it is propelling half the world and making, helping us continue in motion. This power was harnessed initially for bad, but now for good. It's always been there. And the Holy Spirit is like that. The power of the Holy Spirit has been working in our lives, in humanity's life, all throughout history. But then what Luke was saying, he says, then you will receive the power. It's like the word here is the power. The, the word there is dunamis, like dynamic explosion of the power. And what would you do? You will go and be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The purpose for the power of the Holy Spirit is for witnessing. If you're asking for the Holy Spirit for power for every, anything else, you're not going to get it. There are people who I've met who says we need to pray for the Holy Spirit. For what? For repentance. I say, bro, repentance is a byproduct of fulfilling the purpose. If you pray for repentance, you're only looking at yourself. If you continue to look at yourself again and again and again and again, you're going nowhere and the Holy Spirit can only do so much. But if you want to experience the full impact, the power of the Holy Spirit, you can say, God, I want to witness. To be a good witness, I need to repent. Then the power will come. Then you're praying for, praying for the right reason. Then the Holy Spirit can do it. It's work. It's alive. You can't tell me, James, I'm not experiencing the power. I say, are you witnessing? Or are you trying to? If you're not, you're not going to experience the power. And this power is for the very existence of the church. The church exists for that purpose, to witness. To witness means that someone who helps establish facts objectively through verifiable observation. In an accident, when you, when you hit somebody's car, nowadays we have a very good witness, it's called an in-dash camera. Used to be, man, you go down, especially some of the guys driving Honda Civics, I used to drive Honda Civics. When you, the moment an accident happened, they come down and they shout at you, thinking that the loudest one is the correct one. It used to be right. The one who is fiercer, more violent, end up winning the, the argument, and the guy who is not at fault ends up paying because it's too scary. But nowadays, it's easy. We were in a friend's car, right? We were going, going straight, you know, in our lane, minding our own business. And this car comes out from the gas station, the petrol station, right in front of our car. He came out. He was from the, the exit, came out, and my car, boom, straight into him. Dude, it was your fault, he was going crazy, he was going nuts, he was shouting at us, he says, oh, man, can you see I'm coming out? And all we did was we walked up to him, and then we just pointed at the camera. <laughs> and he shut up and apologized immediately. Because we recorded everything. There's nothing to say. I'm not a salesperson for a dash camera. But it's good to have it. <laughs> and on top of that, the witness, if you have somebody, and it happens, some really good Singaporeans will do that. If you get into an accident, if they saw what happened, they will actually stop. And they come up to you and they say, they give you their business card and says, I will be a witness, no problem. They saw a fact. They saw something happen objectively and can be verified. What they've observed is true. And especially in the scripture and in today's modern world, not by one, two or three witnesses. The church is called by God to be his witness after receiving the power. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and so the world. So what is witnessing? It's about looking at facts. And it's about observation. What you are sharing with somebody else is not knowledge. It's not how much you know this Bible. As I said, I've said again and again and again and again here that I've met academics, scholars who can memorize this in Hebrew and Greek and does not believe in God. Knowledge doesn't change. It's important. But the fact, what is this fact that I'm observing? It's your experience with God. Do you have an experience with God? Have you been 
in touch with the church? Does the church facilitate you to help you experience God? That's what we're here for. The church is not this building. This building is called 798 Thompson Road. People always mistake us as the cop house for the condo next door. More than once, I have to stand outside and tell people where we are. Like, it's a church here, and they're like, this is a church? The church is not the building. The church is you guys sitting right here. You are the church. And when you help one another experience God better, you witness. You share the, the fact that you observe what has happened in your life, in the life of other people. It's real. This fact that you experience must be a real experience. It cannot be a theory. It cannot be. Last week I heard Pastor James said this. Christianity is awesome. Pastor James can say something, but you need to go and try it out. It's like Pastor James can tell you how good certain restaurants are. And he always do it. But unless you go and eat for yourself, you don't know what it tastes like. Tell everybody, I'm now an evangelist also, part-time, for 300 grand pizza, because it's been known as the best pizza in the world. It's found in Melbourne, live on street. I can, I, 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 mm, there's no words for me to describe how good it is, and I tell how good the buffalo mozzarella is, how the cheese tastes good, and how the vegetarian pizza tastes like picking duck, I can tell you all that. <laughs> but until you go to 300 ready I want you to eat for yourself the first time. You will not understand this real, solid, awesome fact. Because observation is a direct, personal, first person experience. If you go to a court, you can talk to Jordan about it. You go to a court and he says, Did you see the accident? No, I heard um, Edmund tell me about the accident. Out so quickly. Or you're like, go there. No, I watched it on YouTube. I think what I saw on YouTube was this. Your, your, your statement will not stand. But he says, I saw it for myself at 10 45 a.m., 10th of July 2015. I saw it. Then your witness holds. The church is there to show people and tell people about your witness, how I've experienced God is wonderful, God is loving. How do you know? I experienced it. God changes people. How do you know? I was a rascal, a jerk, a hypocrite that God changed and made me who I am today. I can't tell you about anybody else, but I can tell you about me. I have been changed by that. The facts that we observe are, are real. It's direct. But who are we to witness to? The Bible says first Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, I need to put an I, ends of the earth. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. Where? was this instruction given? Just outside the door, the gates of Jerusalem. That was where he ascended. If you go for the Holy Holy Land tour today, they'll bring you to the exact spot that they claim that Jesus ascended. And then you stand there waiting for the two angels to tell you, what are you standing here? Man? Right outside Jerusalem, Jesus gave the instruction that this Gospel, this witness that you're supposed to share, starts here. We're very good with out there. Very good with, as Theodora shared this morning, Africa, China, Cambodia, USA, <laughs> Indian missions. Talk about places like that. Talk about sending missionaries there, and we. I have more people signing up for mission trips than for local street evangelism. Every single time. Even though you have to pay $2,000 to go overseas to do that witnessing, to be able to go there where there's no toilet, where there's a bucket, where there's to dig sand pit, you're gonna shower in public using well water, there'll be more people signing up for mission overseas than for guys saying, hey, let's go to the streets and share the gospel with our neighbors. Nobody. 
But the Bible is clear. The Bible says, first, first is Jerusalem. You have no business going to Judea if you're not done in Jerusalem. Not that you're done, but you stopped. You have no business going to Samaria if you're not in Judea. You have no business going to end up the world if you're not even in Samaria. In Singapore, what would that be? Your family, your friends. God put you in a specific family for a specific reason. Continually, we will see that the Bible says when people came to God, came to Jesus, their family was brought. So much so that the Caesar's household, the servants that, that I think Paul evangelized, they brought the household of Caesar to Christ. Then they went to their neighbors. Who will be our neighbor today? Doesn't have to be a next year neighbor. Oh, I hope. That will be good. But Singapore, man, I'm so sad. Whenever I come home, right, man, used to be like that. It has changed. The doors will all be closed. There's only three houses on, on my side of, of, the, of the block. Come from the lift. I walk first house close. Second house close. So you think, oh, that I work at night at home. Any time of the day, it's all close. I think one day I, I accidentally bump into my guy who left the house. I'm like, oh, you live here? <laughs> but I know it's scary. Man. But, then, but then we started talking. I'm like, you know, my mom, my mom started talking. You know how back in the kampong, nobody locked the doors, and we're all friends. And so me and the neighbor that's directly across from us, we've made a commitment that whenever we get home, our doors are open. And then the little girls is in the house, and the, and the caretaker, and the grandma, who are homeless on they'll sit at the door and, 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 and talk. And we'll be at the door, and we'll say hi, we'll bring cake, we'll bring curry. Neighbors, be friends. I have a neighbor who is from on the other side of the, the, the block who used to be right there and she will bring me food. Not me, but my family. And she'll bring it over and says, Oh, hi, I'm your neighbor. I'm like, man, you're like the first neighbor who said hi. And he says, Yeah, here's some food. And then why? I found they were Christians. He says, Oh, we've been commitment to talk to everybody on our, on our floor. Not the block, but on our floor. When was the last time you talked to your neighbor? But a neighbor doesn't have to be a guy who's living right beside you. How about the guy who sits beside you at work? You sit there, you talk to that person, you spend most of your day of your life sitting beside this guy. Some people spend more time with their colleagues at work than with their family. You talk to them? Do you, do you, are you their friend? Singapore. Then we work on Singapore, this, this country we are in, the place here for a specific reason. You're not born here by chance. You're not, you're not, you didn't move here by chance. You didn't come here to work by chance. This is a place where there was a plan for you to be here, do something about it. Then we go overseas. First. Imagine you go overseas and you win souls for Christ and, then, and people get baptized. They say, how's your church? And you're like, my church has nobody. How's the mission working? Imagine you're going to, to China, go to Kunming, and you're working with people. Or you're going to Africa, to, 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 to Nigeria, and you're working with people that says, wow, your church must be growing, they can send missionaries here to help us. And it's like, wow, thank you so much for coming. And then they say, how's your church? And my church is dying. <laughs> I look at you and like, brother, you need to spend your time at home. First Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Inclusive. I'm not saying we focus on one only, but the fact I'm bringing out the fact is that we like to focus on one a lot more than the other. Let's work on all of them together. Because the church, the fact that we still have a church in Singapore is the reason. Is, is a proof that God wants us to do something right here. Right here. The fact that our location is here is, is a specific reason. You know, I told you that two churches call us to say when they can rent our buildings on Sunday. Because they say, I said, why? They said, your, your location is awesome. And then last week, 
NTUC Healthcare came and says, can we borrow your auditorium? I'm like, why do you want to borrow our auditorium? And he says, because we want to do public community service to the people around here, your church is the perfect location. People are telling us this, do we know this? She came in and she's like, I said, how much does it cost us? She says, free. I'm going to give you all these things. And I said, why don't you just next door? Or they said, no, you're the best. Do we think we're the best location? Calicot is right there. That's been developed, it's going to be building construction all day long. It's going to become one of the interchanges in the future. Do we realize that? Today, man. Jerusalem. Look at my youth, you have me distribute the Connect card. Remember our Connect card? We give out to our visitors with this church. Give out each person one. I mean, give out each person one. So the Connect card, we pass it to anybody who's new to this place, and if they come two times, they get two cards, the third time, they're family. Right? No cards for family, sorry. Today you get a card. But this card is not for you. Everyone gets one. Everyone gets one. It is not for you to be a bookmark. You need to take one, the connect cards, and I want you to think of a person that you want to put their name on it. You need to pray about it, for the Spirit to guide you, and to pray for one person that you think, I want the person's name to be on this card. It could be an old friend, it could be a family, it could be a new friend, it could be a colleague, your classmate at the school, somebody on the streets, Somebody who lives in Botswana, I don't know. It's a particular person that you want their name to be on this card and it says, well, I want to invite this person to ask that and so that this card is valid and I can pass it to Pastor Jane and says, Pastor Jane, this person is here today. Here's the card. Bring it home. Pray over the card. It says, God, whose name should I put on it? Who should I invite? Maybe this person came once, remember? You can come twice you can still get a card. When he came and he come back. At this point, it's a call. I have, I have a friend who we didn't come to church for 13 years, and um, I called him up one day. I says, "Bro, why are you not at church? I'm the pastor." I said, "No, I'm not going to church. But I'm going to go back to my church." I says, "Cool. What made you change your mind to go back to church?" He says, "Well, just because you come." For 13 years, nobody asked. I just stopped going, nobody bothered, I can't be bothered. You can be bothered, I should be bothered. I didn't do anything. I just said, bro, why are you not in church? We'll be close enough to do that. And maybe one guy in Disney Tech Hall, haven't seen you in a while, I miss you, man. Somebody will just wait for that one reason to go back to church. One person will go back to church. Sure, close your prayer. Father God, we don't know who you want to use us to reach, but Lord, we, we, we hear you when it says you will not, you shall. It's a definite future tense that we, it will happen. We will receive the power of the Holy Spirit and we will be your witness. So Father, help us to be witness to that one person. That's all we ask, that one person for you.